verses 22 uh, to the end of chapter 21 and the first five verses of 22 all deal with the internal description of uh, the New Jerusalem. So we'll begin uh, in chapter 22 or chapter 21, verse 22, with the internal illumination of the city. And that's one thing we'll notice um, is a consistent theme of these uh, of the description of the inside of the city is how it is illuminated by God from within. And that would uh, give us some reason for why everything that has been described to us so far is uh, strikingly transparent, uh, that it can be seen through. The glory and the light of God is not going to be hindered by anything in his new creation. So we have the eternal presence of God, and that is why it is illuminated from within. Beginning in verse 22, it says, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. Now, this is a very important distinction between the eternal state and the messianic kingdom of, for example, Ezekiel 40 through 48, because Ezekiel 40 through 48 spends most of its eight chapters, nine chapters there, uh, describing the temple that is in the messianic kingdom. But here in the eternal state, there is no temple, and there's a good reason for that. Notice as well, this uh, it is feminine, so it's pointing back to city. There is no temple in the city. Um, but we want to know what a temple is, because some people are put off by the fact that there is no temple in the eternal state. They accuse John of being um, anti-Jewish because the Jewish temple is absent, but the temple has its purpose begin in the book of Exodus as God is preparing for the kingdom of Israel, and it has its purpose fulfilled um, first in Christ and then finally in all of its aspects in the messianic kingdom. The temple was a temporary dwelling place for the presence of God among sinful man. And when there is no more sinful man, there is no necessity of a temple or a tabernacle. So God, in order to dwell among his people uh, in this microcosm of, of the mediatorial kingdom, a microcosm of, uh, of creation dominion in Israel, he had to be veiled behind walls because sinful man cannot be in his presence and he can't be in the presence of sinful man without the presence of a sacrifice. And so his presence was girded behind uh, the veil in the Holy of Holies. In Exodus uh, 40, verses 34 and to the end of the chapter, uh, we read, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tab or filled the tabernacle. So once it was filled with the glory of God, Moses was not able to enter. And we can see that no one's able to enter except for the high priest. The temple, which was a later development from the tabernacle, uh, once Israel was settled in its land and once the uh, once the kings of Israel were established, and especially once God had chosen his king through the line of David, and David's son Solomon was on the, uh, on the throne, uh, then there was a temple built in Israel. And when it was completed, 1 Kings 8, uh, verse, chapter 8, verse 10 says, It happened that when the priests came from the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. God's presence is not able to be in the presence of sinful man here. Now, the millennial temple is a little different. The millennial temple is the fulfillment of everything that the physical temple on this earth points towards, everything that it uh, couldn't be uh, prior to the cross but everything that it will be when Jesus Christ, the, the perfect God-man, is able to sit on the throne of this earth, being 
God himself in a central location manifest on earth. Uh, he is the perfect representation of the glory of God. He is able to dwell among his people because he has offered a sacrifice to cover their sins and to take away their sins. So the millennial temple will be different in that sense in that Jesus Christ will be the glory of the temple within it. In Ezekiel 43, verse 4, it says, The glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate facing toward the east, and the Spirit lifted me up, this is Ezekiel speaking, and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Notice the difference here. Moses and the priests in the old temples were not able to come into the, into the uh, temple when it was filled with the glory of the Lord, but here, uh, strikingly, Ezekiel is able to enter into this millennial kingdom or millennial temple. He continues and he says, he said to me, son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell among the sons of Israel forever. And the house of Israel will not again defile my holy name, neither they nor their kings by their harlotry and by the corpses of their kings when they die by setting their threshold by my threshold and their doorpost beside my doorpost with only the wall between me and them. And they have defiled my holy name by the abominations which they have committed, so I have consumed them in my anger. So at the end, there's a little bit of a description for Ezekiel, because remember, Ezekiel is not physically in the time of the millennial kingdom, but he is seeing a vision forward to the kingdom. And there is a reason he's seeing it, because the present state of Israel at that time was going into captivity in Babylon. They were exiled from their land, but there was still this promise left to them of a kingdom. And God is promising and is showing him the fulfillment of that promise where the temple will dwell in the kingdom and the glory of God will return to the temple. Um, and Israel's purpose will be fulfilled and God's purposes for them will be fulfilled. But notice the difference here. Uh, there is not going to be any more defilement in the land. Israel is not going to defile his holy name. Uh, the Even the physical death of bodies, these uh, mortal bodies, is not going to be present there in the land. We're looking forward to a time where regenerated Israel is going to be serving in the temple of God. And that looks forward to the millennial kingdom which, as we've viewed multiple times before in this uh, series, uh, that is the fulfillment of God's purpose with this creation. And so the temple is something unique to this creation that God has uh, instituted in this creation in order to have his presence dwell among sinful men. And so this new Jerusalem, we do have the restored presence of God, but no need for a temple. Uh, when we look back to the Garden of Eden, there was no need for a temple because mankind dwelled in sinless perfection, but it was unconfirmed holiness. They had not been uh, made holy by anything, but they had not committed any sins to make them unholy. So although they did not possess righteousness of their own, they also did not have any sin, which made it impossible for them to, or which would have made it impossible for them to be in the presence of God. Because of sin, a sacrifice was instituted. That's why we see Cain and Abel in the very uh, next chapter after the fall, offering a sin sacrifice uh, in order to approach God at the garden. But here in the New Jerusalem, we have our presence with God restored, and so we don't need that temple because there's no one who is sinful left there so in revelation 21 22 there's no temple left in it for the lord god the almighty and the lamb are its temple and the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it for the glory of god has illumined it and its lamp is the lamb so this is uh, a very similar passage then to where we saw the glory of the lord entering into the temple well, here in the New Jerusalem, the glory of the Lord is already there. It's not entering in because it is there and it's it has been there and will continue to be there. And that is the light of his glory that this uh, kingdom has. 
Revelation 21, 24, the nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, there will be no night there. Its gates will never be closed and they will bring the glory of and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abominations and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So notice how many times we have people, humanity, entering into uh, this presence where God's glory is manifest. We've got the kings of the earth, and they are bringing glory into it. We'll, we'll look at all these verses in, more in a minute. Uh, but this, these, uh, this verb bringing and into it, Pharaoh plus ace, always has the idea of actually penetrating into or within uh, the designated location. And so just as Ezekiel was able to enter into as a temple when the glory of the Lord was in the temple in the messianic kingdom, so also, and in an even greater way, we will be able to enter into and be in the presence of God in the eternal state because we will have been completely regenerated and there will be no sin. So when we are looking at the new creation, the new heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem, we don't want to think back to uh, ways that God... I guess, got around the problem of sin, we want to look back to God's original plan, God's original creation that had no need of a temple. Now, when we look at Eden, there are similarities to how the temple is structured, and that's, uh, that's caused some, when they're looking at Genesis uh, 1 and 2, to see this sort of cosmic temple, they call it, where they believe that creation was created to resemble a temple. I think it's the other way around. I think the temple was instituted to resemble creation, and creation was made to resemble the things in heaven, uh, because God has made a microcosm of the universal kingdom within the mediatorial kingdom. And so that's what we're looking at. We don't want to put the cart before the horse here and say God needs a temple. The temple was a solution to sin. With no sin, there's no need for a temple. God was able to be in the presence of man and man in the presence of God in the garden before the fall. And we see a shadow of that in Genesis 3.8. says, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And so had they not hid themselves, who knows what may have happened. Uh, but we do know from various comments such as uh, Samuel's parents made and or, no, Samson's parents made and also that uh, Moses made that man can't sin or stand in the presence of God without dying. But John and first John looks forward to a time in which we will be able to be in his presence and to actually look upon him. And so. It should not surprise us then that we see no temple in the eternal state because the problem of sin, of sin has been completely dealt with and is something totally of um, the previous creation and does not touch the new creation. So there's no need for a temple because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. They are the presence of God dwelling among mankind. In verse 23, it says, The city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it. Now, this is a little different than um, some of his previous statements of there is none, there is none, there is none. For example, there is no temple. We can be certain that there is no temple anywhere in the new creation. There is no sea. We can be certain that there is no sea in the new heavens and new earth. But here it says that there is no need of the sun or of the moon. Now, the natural reading and the, the reading I go with here is that there actually is no sun or moon, uh, but it's not as clear on this point as it is on others, so we have to allow for the possibility that there may be a sun and a moon, uh, but they will not serve the same promise or uh, purpose that they have served in this creation if they exist at all in the new heaven and new earth. Uh, keep in mind then here, what was the purpose of the sun and the moon? Genesis 1, 14 through 15 tells us um, about the creation of the sun and the moon. 
said, God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens. And here's a bunch of purposes for it. To separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. So we have separation of day and night. Well, as we'll see in a minute, there's no more night in uh, in the new creation. So there's no need for sun and a moon to separate or distinguish night and day. Uh, for signs, for seasons, for days and years, uh, we'll see what looks like uh, a a different sign that God uses for months, at least, um, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. Well, what we're looking at here in the present context is that there is no need for uh, these artificial lights. Uh, we don't think of the sun and moon as artificial light, but it is. Uh, we don't need these artificial lights because we have true light in the new kingdom. Now, or in the new creation, uh, God said, let there be these, uh, these lights in the expanse of the heavens, and it was so. And in verse 16, the creation of these lights is explained to us as God made. Uh, God made the two great lights, and greater the two great lights, the greater to govern the day, the lesser to govern the night. So we have specifications for each one. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens. And here's his purposes again. To give light on the earth, now unnecessary in the new heavens and new earth. To govern the day and the night, unnecessary in the new heavens and new earth. And to separate the light from the darkness, again, unnecessary. And God saw that it was good. But God created these two lights. And he created them on the fourth day of creation. Uh, but there was light before the fourth day, and that is true light. First uh, John 1, 5 tells us something of the nature of God that makes sense when we get to the end of Revelation here. And it makes sense at the beginning of Genesis as well, because John says, this is the message we've heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Now, John in his, in his epistle is going to use this um, to explain something else of God's character, uh, that he is perfectly holy, but um, it also is true that God in his physical presence is light, and we see that testified to uh, all over in scripture, that God's presence is characterized by the light of his glory. And in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, we see uh, that there is darkness from the very beginning of the, the present created order that we're in, though there will not be in the new heavens and new earth. Um, but from the very beginning, there is the presence of light. Uh, so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Now, God's light or his glory is apparently veiled here because he has to unveil his own light for this creation. Genesis 1.3 says, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light, or that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning one day. Now, this is different from how God describes all of the other creations in the creation week. For example, looking back here, chapter 1, verse 16, God made the two great lights. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That was his creation on day one. Uh, very often when you see the six-day creation in visual forms, it makes the creation of day one light. Light was not created on day one. Light was revealed, and it is the uncreated creature, God, uh, and his light that is revealed it is the heavens and the earth that are created on day one, and light, God himself, is revealed to reveal the glory of his own creation. And so uh, we should not be surprised that in the new heavens and the new earth, there is no need for these artificial lights because the true light that illuminated the original creation uh, is there and visible. 
And that is exactly what John says at the end of verse 23, for the glory of God has illumined it and its lamp is the lamb. So there is no need for these artificial lights in the skies. All right. Verse 24 has caused some debate among biblical scholars. It says the nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Now in Zechariah and in the rest of the book of Revelation, the kings of the earth are used to describe those kings which are allied with the Antichrist. And so people try to come up with different interpretations for this. But we have to remember that this is a new heaven and a new earth. The kings of the earth in the previous portion of Revelation are kings of the earth because the earth is under the power of the Antichrist or the false messiah and Satan. Here with the new heavens and new earth, kings who are characterized by this earth are characterized by the same God who rules over it. And so these are not evil kings of the earth, but these are the good kings who will rule in the earth in the new heavens and new earth. The nations, um, this Greek word ethnos, can mean Gentiles, specifically meaning those nations which are not Israel, or it can mean nations in their political divisions. So these nations will walk by its light. Some try to squeeze in here the interpretation that these are Gentiles, and I don't think that holds up here because many of the things which the nations are described as doing, um, it would be inappropriate to exclude Israel from these descriptions. Israel, as well as the rest of the kings of the earth, Israel, as, rest as, as well as the rest of the kings of the earth, are going to walk by God's light. It's not going to just be the Gentiles, uh, and they will bring their glory into it. Now, some people would say then, well, ethnos is a term used for the nations which are not Israel. Uh, and that's not completely true. Generally, that is the case because that is how Israel is distinguished from the rest of the nations. But ethnos is a term that depends on the context. If there is no contrast being made with the rest of the nations, if we're just speaking of the nation of Israel, ethnos is the term for nation that is used. And so in Genesis 11, uh, 48 through uh, 53, I believe, we see this conversation among the high priests in Israel as they're talking about their own nation. And they say, if we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation, our ethnos. But one of them, Caiaphas, who is high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for one or expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation ethnos not perish. Caiaphas is here talking about the nation of Israel using the term ethnos that in this context does not mean Gentile, but Israel. Uh, continuing on in verse 51, now he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And now it is contrasted, but notice it's even con contrasted so that ethnos means Israel, where the rest of them, or the, the rest of what is stated, uh, points towards the Gentiles. So ethnos is, is the other side of the contrast in this statement. Uh, not for the nation, singular, Israel only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad, not being part of Israel or not part of the nation of Israel. And so it is uh, not true that ethnos cannot mean Israel. Ethnos can include Israel, and when all the nations are spoken of broadly, where there's no distinction between these nations uh, and Israel made in the context, the most natural reading is to include Israel within the scope of ethnos. We see the same thing in Revelation 5.9 when we're looking at the scope of Christ's sacrificial atonement. If we exclude Israel from the ethnos, the nations, then we don't have 
atonement for Israel, and that's problematic. Revelation 5, 9, they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. This includes Israel. Now, let's see, going back to here. The nations, being all the political entities, will walk by its light. And the kings, again, in the context here of nations, we have to look at these as political entities because we've got kings being brought up here and they have a domain or a rule, and that is over nations. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Another uh, problem or controversy, I guess, over this verse is, well, how do we have kings of the earth who are part of God's redeemed people bringing glory into the uh, into the city, into the presence of God, if in Revelation 3.12, speaking to the overcomers who are the redeemed of God, uh, we have this promise that I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. So how can they come into this city into the new jerusalem if they are a permanent pillar in the temple of god and they do not go out from it anymore well this is confusing the terms here because if you remember back in verse 22 it said there is no temple but god is the temple and if we look down we see the new jerusalem mentioned but it doesn't say that they will never go out from the new jerusalem it says that they will never go out from the temple of my God. And I think this is a descriptive genitive is what it's called of my God, meaning that is the description of that temple. It's not a, not a temple like was in Israel, but it is God. And so he is not going out anymore from the presence of God. That is the promise here. So it is perfectly plausible that these kings who are eternal fixtures in the presence of God, because God is in the new uh, creation, omnipresent, then he's not departing from God's presence, even if he is not within the city walls of the new Jerusalem. Uh, so most of that is just because whenever you pick up a commentary here, you're going to get pages and pages of uh, rationalization of why the nations mean um, either the Gentiles or what not? In fact, Bob Thomas, who's got one of the longest commentaries on Revelation, he goes through a bunch of these different options, and he lands on one that I think is completely untenable, which is that these nations uh, indicate uh, people who will be in the eternal state, but not in regenerated, resurrected bodies. They'll be in bodies of confirmed holiness, much like Adam and Eve would have had had they not fallen. Uh, but this is difficult, um, very difficult, not impossible. Uh, but in order to do that, you would need a different race of humanity uh, because we've got the millennial kingdom interceding in which all will obtain resurrection bodies. And so you would need to start humanity over again. And so they would not be uh, part of this race of mankind there would not be the same unity with Christ uh, that we have because he has become mankind. He's taken on the flesh, specifically flesh that goes back to the federal um, head of the race to Adam. That's why Luke traces his genealogy all the way back to Adam. We would have a break in that genealogy and they would not uh, have the same uh, flesh as Christ has. And so we, we just have too many problems when we start to try to fix uh, doctrinal problems with false solutions, we end up with more problems. Uh, and so it, it is just most natural and easiest to take this as being nations as they've always been understood, these political entities 
and they have kings just like we have kings today. Uh, they will have people in authority over those nations or in greater stratifications of authority, and they will be able to come in and out of the city of the New Jerusalem, and they will bring their glory into it. What does that mean then, their glory? Revelation 3.21 says, He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So we see a, um, a sharing of authority, of rulership with the redeemed. Revelation 2, 26 through 28, we see degrees of authority based on um, obedience in this life. So we've got two conditions here, he who overcomes being all the regenerated and he who keeps my deeds until the end being the one who is, remains faithful. To him, I will give authority over the nations and he shall rule with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces as I also have received authority from my father and I will give him the morning star. So as we looked at when we got to the millennial kingdom, this rule begins in the kingdom of Jesus Christ on this earth. But what we're looking at in Revelation 21 and 22 is that kings, nations, authority, rule does not end with this creation, but it continues on forever. And that's important as well because the the kingdom of this creation, the mediatorial kingdom, is being done away with at the end of chapter 20. And in chapter 21, we have a new creation. Jesus Christ does not lose his throne when the previous creation is, uh, is destroyed, but his rule is going to continue into the new heavens and new earth, and we don't cease to rule with him with this, but we being in him now have this rule in the new heavens and the new earth as well. So this is explaining our role in the new heavens and new earth, that we will be some of these kings uh, in the new heavens and new earth. Now, the glory that they're bringing in does not originate with them, but it has been manifest through them. And we see this in John 17, how the believer who is in Christ manifests his glory because he is glorified. John 17, 20 through 21, after he spends the first half of this chapter, and this whole chapter is called the high priestly prayer. It comes at the end of the upper room discourse. The first eight verses or so um, is Christ uh, discussing his own glory, his glory that was before his incarnation, the glory that is uh, now about to be restored to him. Then in 9 through 19 or so, he talks specifically to the apostles, or he prays about the apostles specifically, that God would protect them, uh, that he would keep them just as he's kept them while he has been with them. But in verse 20, he turns to addressing all believers who are going to receive the gospel that these apostles are about to go out and preach. And so in John 17, 20, he says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may be, uh, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that uh, the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, so that uh, they may see my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. So we see that this purpose that he has of uh, being united with him in his presence and sharing in his glory does not terminate with the present uh, creation, but continues into the next. All right, Revelation 21, verse 25, verses 25 and 26. So he says, in the daytime. Now, in Revelation and in most of the scripture, and in fact, in most of the conversations that have occurred in this present creation, Daytime is used to distinguish 
day from night. It was developed that way. It was created that way from the very first day of creation. Day was a distinction between the dark time and the light time. And so that's why he's adding a clarification here. And he says, for there will be no night there. This is an explanatory clause. It's explaining how the, he can use the term daytime still. Well, in essence, there is no other term for it. Light is daytime. So there is only light. There's only daytime. There's no nighttime. Um, and so we, we could just call it time then because time is going to be characterized with light. But it says in the daytime, its gates will never be closed. And so if there is no night, then it's always daytime. And if while it's daytime, the gates are never closed, then obviously the gates will never be closed. Now, this also is interesting because so far we've seen there's no need for the light of the sun or the moon. Now we see that there's only daytime, there's no nighttime. And it makes us think a lot about this creation, specifically the promise that we have that this creation is going to continue until God's purposes are fulfilled in it. So now that John is going what seems to be out of his way to explain the change um, between the next creation and this creation, we can see evidence and proof that all of God's purposes in this creation and this earth have been fulfilled. Um, and we, we, have, we look back to Genesis a lot to see that. But Genesis 8, uh, we see something similar to what we're looking at in Genesis uh, 20, or in Revelation 21 and on, because the original creation was structured a bit differently than the creation that we dwell in today. God wiped it clean with a flood, and that changed some of the, the way that this nature, this creation functions. And after the flood, God made a promise to Noah that he wasn't going to make the same sort of cataclysmic changes that he did at the flood again until this earth passes away, essentially. And so looking back to this promise that God made with Noah in Genesis 8, 16, we read, God tells Noah, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you, bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you birds and animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So that was the order of creation after the flood, the command to repopulate this earth in its present function. Uh, in verse 18, so Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by their families from the ark then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. And so this is the beginning of God's promise that he is not going to destroy in the same way that he has destroyed before, but he continues and he says, while the earth remains. Now, this temporal clause sort of alludes to the fact that this earth will not remain forever, but he is going to sustain it in its present cosmology so long as it remains, meaning no big great flood, nothing of the sort until God is ready to remake the whole thing. So while this earth remains, seed time and harvest, so we've got seasons, cold and heat, again, seasons, summer and winter, seasons, and day and night, shall not cease. Well, in the new heavens and new earth, we see that day and night has ceased. It is completely just day. This is a different, uh, we are looking at something different in Genesis 21 than we did in, Gen or sorry, in Revelation 21 than we did in Revelation 20. This is something different than in um, Isaiah 60 through 66. This is something different than in Ezekiel 40 through 48. This is not the messianic kingdom, which will still have day and night, or which will still have um, these seasons and days and uh, whatnot. This is a new creation. 
We also look to Jeremiah 31, 35 to see how God attaches the present order to his purpose in this order. So Jeremiah 31, 35 comes right after the promise of the uh, new covenant, which is going to regenerate Israel and make them able to keep God's laws. It says, thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day. So this is reminding us of his uh, created order and that he is the creator and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night. Notice we've got moon, stars, and specifically this mention of night, um, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. These are all things that we see have disappeared in the new heavens and new earth. But this Lord of hosts is his name. And he continues in verse 37, thus says, Lord, if the heavens above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will also cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. Well, none of that is possible, and this fixed order is not going to depart. Actually, that was verse 36, which I somehow erased. Uh, verse 36 says that if this fixed order, this fixed order of the sun by day and the moon by night, uh, and the the sea, which has its waves, which roar. If that fixed order departs, then God will also depart from his people or he will have them depart from him. He's not going to cast them off so long as the heavens can't be measured and the foundations of the earth can't be searched. In other words, he's not going to cast them off because in the context here, God has a purpose for them that he is going to fulfill. He has promises to them that he's going to fulfill. Well, he fulfills those promises to them in the messianic kingdom. And at that point, he is not casting them off for the things that they have done. Although their purpose has been fulfilled, they will continue to exist because God has established them forever. Um, but the, the sun, the moon, the stars, the sea, all of that is unnecessary in the new heavens and new earth, although Israel and the nations will remain. All right, so into this city, the new Jerusalem, its gates will never be closed. They will remain open permanently. Again, if we look at this as, uh, as the fulfillment of what the temple looks towards, the temple was only, or the Holy of Holies, was only accessible one time a year. These gates will never be closed, and kings of the earth, in the plural, they will be able to enter into it. It's not just a high priest, but we have king priests in view. They're able to enter in directly to the presence of God in the new Jerusalem. And they will bring not only glory, but honor into it. And this is the glory and the honor of the nations into it as these nations reflect God's glory. And we have in those previous verses then the positive things that will enter into it. And to make it extra clear, he states the negative things which will not enter into it. He says, nothing unclean, which is kainos in the Greek, anything impure or profane, anything less than perfect, will not enter into it. And no one who practices abomination and lying. Now, this specifically looks back to earlier portions of Revelation and earlier por portions of Scripture. Uh, but we see in Revelation 17, 4 through 5, that this was part of the primary character of the city of Satan, the city of the Antichrist. We're looking at the eternal city of God in the New Jerusalem. But here in Revelation 17, we see the beginning of Satan's, um, Satan's counterfeit city. Revelation 17, 4, the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Again, looks like he's just trying to mimic God's new Jerusalem. She has in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead, a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So John is making a very stark contrast between the sort of city, the sort of dwelling and abode of Satan and the dwelling place of God in the eternal order. Now, the, the uh, statement that well, there will be no abominations, nothing unclean, lying seems almost out of place here. 
we kind of put that on a lower tier of sins. We've got, yeah, unclean things. That's pretty unspecific, but it's just anything bad. Abominations, once again, yeah, that's pretty unspecific, just bad things. But then lying, and I think part of our temptation might be to, to hedge, and I know the world likes to make a distinction between white lies and and bad lies, as if white lies aren't bad things, even though white lies are contrary to the truth. But I think, once again, this is very important because we're in the context of a new creation. We always want to keep in the back of our minds the original creation. And the problem that occurred in the original creation began with a lie. And that lie was specifically, you can be like God. John 8, 44 says, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan murdered with a lie to begin with. A lie was the imposition of Satan's truth, Satan's will over God's truth and God's will, the way that God had created and the purpose for which God had created to execute his will over a mediatorial kingdom, Satan came in and corrupted that with a lie. 1 John 2.22, John states, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one opposed to the Anointed One, the one who denies the Father and the Son. This is the one who is opposed to him, and it's that opposition that is going to foment into the beast's kingdom in Revelation. Genesis 3, 4 through 5, the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan's first tactic with Eve was to see if she was open to a lie, if she held the word of God as an absolute authority, and he saw her hedging her bets on God's word. And so he steps in, and this is the record of the very first lie in creation. Satan, the liar, was able to enter into the original creation. It is very important that nothing unclean no one who practices abominations and lying shall ever come into it, because this is the positive declaration that there will never be any threat to this kingdom. There will not be any threat from anything like Satan that will be allowed into this kingdom. God will protect and preserve it. But we do, once again, get the statement of those who do enter. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And once again, I think this is why it would be troublesome to include a different race of human beings into this new heavens and new earth. Because those whose names were written in the Lamb's book of life, those who were redeemed by the Lamb, uh, well, were redeemed by the Lamb, those are the only ones who are able to enter in here. Revelation 3, 5, he who overcomes, those who overcome in Christ, because Christ overcame the world and we are in him, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, God's righteousness through Christ, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So we don't have anyone passing from the messianic kingdom, from the previous creation, into the new creation whose name was not written in the Lamb's book of life. And so if their name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, they are not in the new heavens and new earth. And so we have only regenerated persons there, and they are all able to enter into this city. Uh, and there does not exist any threat to this city. Nothing will ever enter into it that is uh, corrupt or opposed to God's will. And the mention then of all of those things that will not come in is to not to say that those exist in the new heavens and new earth, 
but to say that there will not be anything that will arise in the new heavens and new earth that will threaten God's will in it. Thank you.